keynote talk entitled Implementation of Digital Applications and Tools in the Austrian Health System by Dr. Degis Egger Marquez. So Dr. Degis Egger Marquez, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Dr. Sarban. Good to see you again in this context virtually. Um, yes, thank you. Um, my name is Alexander Degelsegger Marquez. Um, Marty Salvan said everything you needed to know. We are we consider ourselves the Austrian National Public Health Institute and have a role in facilitating discussions among the stakeholders with as much evidence base as possible and um, as uh, detached from institutionalized interests as possible, which is a very uh, difficult thing to do, but I think it's worthwhile, especially in the topic of, of digitalization. And I shall also say in advance that it's really amazing to see structures uh, like the LB Digital Health in Salzburg emerge because I think they, um, they are, they bring us forward in, in designing a healthcare and an innovation system around healthcare, which brings me to my, my presentation today. So what I want to do is first of all, propose a kind of bird's eye view on where we stand in digitalization in the Austrian health system. Um, we have at least some data on, on what's going on um, and I'm uh, looking forward to sharing and discussing this with you. And then I try to link this view of what is out there with the question um, inspired by sort of innovation studies and public health perspective. What, what is it? Where, where should we go? What is missing? What's, uh, what's done already? And what's, what's a bit of the, the problem? Um, so first of all, uh, conflicts of interest, uh, nothing reported. If we look at digitalization in the Austrian health system, a recent survey, uh, which is part of the European uh, health literacy survey campaign, um, brought forward a couple of interesting numbers for the points I want to make here. So if we look at what the people in Austria are using digital resources for related to health, um, we see that um, a large majority, of course, makes use of online resources like websites to search for, uh, for health information. Um, a lot of them use social media um, as well and, and use some sort of digital device, uh, smartwatches, sensors, etc., related to health and care. Interestingly, it's still rather low. 26%, uh, for instance, use digital opportunities for interaction with health professionals. So this would be things like booking an appointment. Um, so this is the first issue I want to point the finger on a little bit. This is where, where things are still pretty much in development in Austria. And a couple of additional statistics in this case from the OECD, um, they draw a similar picture. So here is from the Health at a Glance report 2021. Um, the information on the share of adults searching for health information online, which is uh, in Austria, I've highlighted it, we are pretty much in the OECD average. We are not uh, among the Nordics where this is uh, still more important, but also not, uh, not outliers on the low end. It looks a bit different when we look at the share of adults who received services uh, via telemedicine. This was uh, at the start, since the start of the pandemic and compared 2020 with 2021. So a little surprisingly, there was a growth because there were more, um, more offers, but still in that category, we are not among the forerunners. Another interesting and recent source of information is uh, the EU does regular benchmarking of e-government across the EU. And this is not only related to health, but since two years ago, they also look at uh, health specific benchmarks. So the methodology works that way that you have a certain number of mystery shoppers, they move around in the countries and follow, they, they do a web search uh, and, and sort of test the system with regard to specific life events. So for instance, uh, if you are uh, in need of healthcare, can you look for a health professional online? Can you do any consultation? Can you um, engage with your medical records? Um, and in the health specific domain, um, the results for Austria show that we are fairly okay in terms of user centricity. Uh, transparency is, is, um, is, is, is lower. There is some main key enablers, but there is no um, usage throughout of the EID. So that's a bit of a, sc a scattered system still and cross-border services are, um, are still a bit limited. This uh, relates especially to English versions of specific um, um, public portals on the web and, and cross-border user support. So interestingly, if we compare not only sort of the absolute numbers, but if we compare with the EU average, this report also shows we are subpar 
when it comes to booking and changing appointments online, for instance, uh, conducting consultations and receiving prescriptions at hospitals. So um, all these statistics show that there, there is, of course, as we all know, uh, um, a functioning e-health infrastructure in Austria. The patient-facing side in terms of the interact, uh, digitalizing the interactions with the health system is something that is still work in progress. So now let's look from a, a different angle at where we stand, uh, namely from what solutions are out there. Um, and this is quite a tour de force and it could be a whole presentation about each of these points, but still I, I will try to, um, to go through this. Um, my colleague Alex Kolman already mentioned uh, a lot of this as well, so I'm happy to, to build on this. We, uh, of course, have ELGA as uh, the core of our yield infrastructure, specifically for B2B professional to professional exchange. So you have your discharge reports there, you have your medication there, and you have your vaccination records there. Um, around ELGA, there is developments ongoing and the infrastructure is, is evolving. Advanced patient directives, for instance, um, there is projects on imaging data and a, a couple of other initiatives uh, around this sort of ELGA core. And as we also see, the regions, the lender are using the ELGA infrastructure to provide additional services in their regions. The uh, social insurance, the statutory health insurance uh, has digital services on offer as well, like the e-recipe, the e-prescription, the um, minor is file portal where you can um, engage with the insurance for your administrative purposes. Visit E is a um, telemedicine video conferencing software solution for, um, for the outpatient sector, the public outpatient sector that they developed. And of course, they run the, uh, the whole e-card uh, infrastructure in the background. Within this environment, there is uh, additional initiatives in the regions, in the lender, health data platforms, initiatives around imaging data, virtual organizations, hospital teleconsultations. Um, and in the case of Salzburg, uh, Salzburg is pretty much at the forefront in all of these uh, areas and, and, and has developments ongoing. There is 1450, the health hotline, where um, discussions are currently also undertaken on how this can be develop further and, and where, where it should head to. Um, many of you will know the dynamics that this hotline got with, with COVID that at the beginning, um, when, when I suspected that I had COVID very early stages of the pandemic, I also was among the ones calling for 1450 and it was a time where they still didn't have a solution and couldn't send you uh, efficiently to a testing uh, hotspot, but all that changed and developed quite a bit. So now the question is, can you link that also to chatbot functionality? Can you develop it into a, a individualized web portal, etc.? Uh, there are some public portals out there. Gesundheit TVAT has uh, validated health information uh, and is the access point to ELGA currently. Klinik Suche.at has information about health professionals. There are uh, apps out there, um, public or publicly co-developed. Uh, we heard about Aktivplan app here also uh, today, Rauchfrei app, Wund app, and some others. Uh, there is intramurally um, quite a number of applications in teleradiology, pathology, dermatology, and rehab. And um, outpatient, but also sort of at the interface, outpatient, inpatient, there is some um, well-established telemonitoring uh, projects around heart insufficiency and diabetes care and heart implant monitoring. And then, of course, there is a, a very dynamic landscape of research projects and pilots at universities, at uh, FHs, at non-university research institutions. Um, with my team uh, at GERC, we are currently uh, finishing a study that we undertook for the ministry and that we could carry out thanks to the help of the experts in the, in the lender, where we look at what kind of telemedicine and AI solutions are uh, available or under development. And this is just to show you uh, as a sort of sneak preview um, that this is a very dynamic health uh, landscape. We found 63 telemedicine services uh, or pilots in the, in the nine lender and 42 AI services. In telemedicine, uh, most of the uh, initiatives are around remote monitoring, uh, followed by interactive services and some are mainly focusing on sort of purely store and forward solutions. And in AI, a lot is about diagnostics, um, slightly slower, uh, slightly lower share is on treatment and um, a bit on, on risk prediction uh, algorithms for risk profiling, et cetera. So 
this was quite the tour de force now along sort of trying to map what's out there in Austria. So the question, uh, of course, pops up. So then what is missing is, is everything is so dynamic. Is that enough? Are we already on track? Um, it is a dynamic landscape. What is missing? A few bullets. And this is, of course, up for discussion. For instance, if we compare to other countries, there is no public, central, patient-facing health app like there would be in, 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 in the UK or how uh, it's shaping up in Germany with the uh, Elektronische Patientenakte and the way this is integrated in the insurance uh, apps. Um, there is no systematic onboarding, um, to use that word, of third-party health apps. So if you are developing a health app um, with a, an interesting solution, you can, if you are, um, of course, um, allowed to, to access the market in following the EU regulations, uh, you can market it in sort of in the private sector and on, 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 the, um, on the app stores, but there is no defined way of how you would get that app into public reimbursement. And we again know that there's a lot of work has been done on that in Germany um, with the uh, prescription possibility for apps and, and is going on in Belgium. Um, other countries have processes here, we, we don't at this point. Another big issue always is interoperability, meaning um, there is a couple of interface um, issues and in German we would say Technologiebrüche. If you think about the way clinics interact with registers, registers with research and patient data with the clinics, uh, this is um, things where you have uh, where you have troubles. You cannot get, get the patient reported data because there is no standards. Um, data protection issues are not clear. You have um, register uh, requirements uh, that are different for different registers, which is a, a challenge for the clinics that provide the data. Data in general is work in progress. Health data at some points is lacking. Sometimes it's of limited quality and sometimes it's there, but it's not accessible for those that would need it for legitimate reasons. Um, and another thing where uh, we are uh, not at the state of the art is in terms of orientation of the consumers. So patients, but also health professionals, they, they don't have official sources of um, where they could, would go to and, and find information where you can recommend that app for this. We have shown that there is the, the evidence is there. This is proven, um, et cetera. So why is this? Um, in a certain sense, it's simply a question of, of funding, um, pipelines, uh, and, and priorities and commitment. Sometimes it's uh, the, the standards are not there yet, and there is pending regulatory issues. Um, but sometimes it's also a bit more than that. Sometimes it's that we lack the business models around that. And this leads me to the question, is this what we face here? Is it sort of a digital innovation challenge? Um, is it about finding a way of dealing with um, these new digital opportunities? In order to answer that, I think we have to take a step back and consider that, especially if you look at the system from a public public health and, and, and regulators point of view, um, it's all embedded in a, in, in a couple of broader health system challenges. And I just mentioned a few here that are relevant to the digitalization sphere. The way we deal with chronic disease, which are a huge burden on, on health systems in Austria and elsewhere, um, is very intricately linked with the question of how we digitalize our health system. Um, also the question of to what extent and how can we move, move from curative medicine to preventive medicine? How do we decide on and implement the best point of care? For instance, the role of primary care, et cetera. How do we ensure the quality of care? How do we deal with uh, problems we have in terms of health workforce? Um, so in terms of the health policy regulators, this is the, the, the problems motivating them to find solutions and digital solutions can provide solutions, can, can, can provide answers partly. But sometimes those developing these innovations are not involved in the system-wide discussions that much because there is no, not enough at least established channels. A bit more of context also is of course that we are um, facing market dynamics that are 
typical to the health market. It's a highly regulated market, and it's characterized different from many other markets from um, in information asymmetry between some very relevant stakeholders. So healthcare providers and patients, consumers, for instance, between citizens and health insurance, for instance. You as a patient, you know how you feel and what your problem is, and you, uh, you report that in a certain way. Health insurance has data on you and can do things with it or not and, and report it to you. Uh, or not, uh, physicians have to think about the way they communicate and what they communicate when with patients. Um, also, there is an information asymmetry between uh, the new market entrants like startups and established corporations that have all the regulatory affairs um, figured out and, and, and have established um, resources to deal with that. Um, another very interesting thing when we think about digitalization is that typically in the health market, the power of patients is rather limited and there is a lack of a retail market. So it's a culture change that's necessary. I still don't go to a physician and say, hey, I found that app and I have this data. Let's figure out a solution together. Um, it's not a typical way of, of, of interaction. And simply because I demand it to be doesn't mean that, that this is heard because there's um, contractual obligations that the physicians have that don't allow for that amount of time. There is interfaces lacking, et cetera. We also, of course, face the fragmentation of care, especially in, uh, in a system as complex as Austria's. Um, and interesting on the other side now, if we look at the new market entrants that head to the health market with uh, innovative and great ideas around digital solutions, um, they have a lot of um, R&I funding between, behind them publicly and privately, and they have a lot of expectations on what digitalization can do in the health market, but they don't know uh, necessarily this, this other side. So in a sense, we also face a, um, a social innovation challenge, one could say. In, and the next slide, this is out of innovation, innovation studies. If we want to do innovation policy for health, there is different policy options. So um, traditional innovation policy is very much focused around research and innovation. You provide funds to get the best uh, solutions developed and out there. Uh, at some point in the 80s and 90s, um, it became clear that, well, we have to think about innovation from a systems perspective. We have to think about how do we have the right alliances, coordination among the actors, do they interact in the proper way, is learning possible? So that's sort of the systems of innovation perspective. Uh, in the 2000s, we then had the mission orientation added. So the realization that if we want to direct innovation, not only towards um, private market potential, but public goods and public outcomes, we need, um, we need missions behind the stuff we are funding, for instance. And then most recently, also related to sustainability uh, discussions, is the realization where we have to think about all the social technical things that have to change in order for innovation to happen. Um, so we mean we have to have directionality in terms of missions, we have to have policy coordination in terms of networks, we have to articulate what the demand is in a system like the public health system, and we have to be reflexive and learn as we go along. So if we look again, how do we innovate in digital healthcare? We can say that the technology push still dominates. So we have initiatives by health systems actors. They are within the system. They know where the problem is. Um, they have a, a project and good ideas and they want to push it out there. Um, there's a lot of these concepts around and, and it's very tricky for the payers to, 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 to fund everything, of course, and then also to filter and prioritize. And then there's the innovations by the outsiders and the new market entrants with um, um, the, if you so wish, also a certain way, um, these waves of hyped um, innovation and expectations that this, this market can now be transformed by digitalization. And so the public and private r &I investment often focuses on the area with the expected market potential. So it comes with this digitalization idea, um, but it doesn't necessarily come with the idea we have to um, repair the way we do integrated care. Um, so the question is, where's the demand pool? There is some procurement of innovation, but it happens very often in fairly closed markets, so it's not really accessible for, for new entrants. There is some innovative regulation, but the healthcare regulators, with all the systems pressure, they usually don't understand themselves as innovation system designers, right? So, and the innovation policy 
comes out of supporting um, a market actor. So they often have a bit of a difficulty in meeting and speaking. And then in terms of standards, they are there. There's diffusion and regular optic are, are slow though. Very interestingly, if you look at uh, a few projects that everybody among us might know, so the demand for an innovation is very clear to the proponents sometimes. Yes, of course, we need that kind of digital solution because it improves the, situ the, the situation for my patients that much. But if you go through the sort of decision-making uh, change and especially with the buyers, the demand is less clear because they don't see the evidence, they don't trust the evidence. So there is a methodology uh, lacking that would allow them to prioritize sort of objectively. And then you get sub optimal outcomes where you have individual deals and, and not the, the best solution for the systems. So very provocatively, one might say digital innovation is easy in the sense of, okay, you can um, put a new digital uh, gadget or, or, or service out there fairly easily, but social innovation is hard in terms of getting it into the system and getting people to change to accommodate what you want to achieve with that thing. So is digital innovation different? We could say, well, it's compared to, for instance, traditional um, medicinal product innovation in pharma, there is a relatively low cost to a working prototype. Rollout costs are then often high because that's where you hit regulatory requirements, that's where you hit process adjustments that are necessary. And then you realize, oh, okay, just because it works on my clinic doesn't mean that I can um, uh, sell it to three clinics, three other clinics, because some might be busy with other issues. Uh, and the fourth clinic might have a different solution that they're developing on their own. Um, there is typically, not in all areas, but mostly in weak IP protection, protection compared to other uh, areas of innovation. So it's very important to be fast. And this, of course, then uh, competes with the requirements in terms of regulatory and with the requirement that you have to, to keep the healthcare timelines in, in, in mind, right? To change the way we organize diabetes care is a multi-year, if not decade-long process. Uh, so the question is, what cycle of digital innovation do you have next to that? And how can you pick up and incorporate digital innovation into these discussions? Digital innovation also is potentially disruptive and highly scalable. Um, and um, on this point, the next slide also, but the, an additional uh, interesting point is what Nambisan and others are calling ontological reversal. So if we look at digitalization in uh, tourism industry, for instance, the, uh, we started off saying, okay, there is now not only a physical airplane ticket, but there is also a digital version of it, right? So the thing was you had your ticket and it was somewhere registered in a computer. And the ontological reversal is that nowadays the real is actually the digital. So the ticket exists in the digital space somewhere in the cloud and you can have a paper copy, but the actual thing that counts is not the paper copy you have right now at the hand, but what the system has registered in terms digitally. And this is a very interesting question with regard, with regard to health, because of course health is the most material and physical area and mo most closest to us. So the question is, where is the real information about a person, for instance, with the datification of medicine, et cetera, is, is then the, um, the datafied body in the, in the cloud space more real? Has, does it have more real information about an individual than what you can see in a physical exam? So this is specifics about the digital space. And due to these specifics, um, there have been some very far-reaching and radical new products and services and novel business models in, 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 in different sectors, but not so much in healthcare. Because in healthcare so far, we have implemented digital technology a lot to uh, sustain the way we, we, we provide healthcare, but it didn't really revolutionize business models yet in the sector, uh, which is not wrong in principle, it's just an observation. Um, and it, it didn't principally change the, what, what healthcare costs and how accessible it is and then the quality of it. So the question is business model innovation. Do we need business model innovation then? So where do these pro disruptive products come from? How do we fit them into the system and into these sort of long um, innovation processes in, in healthcare in general? Um, also, these disruptive products will not always appeal to anyone, especially not in the first place, because they might be worse than established solutions, they might have troubles with the, with the evidence, etc. And also, not all disruptive innovations are compatible with the way we want to continue to develop our uh, health systems. Think about the initiatives of, of Amazon and, and, uh, and Google and Apple in health, um, where sort of a dystopian future um, 
that I always like to put out there is if you have all the information that Amazon has on our consumption behavior, and if they are the ones offering health services, including health insurance, it might not be the way we want to develop our system. So one concrete example that, that uh, shows how individual digital innovation can sort of lead to discussions about, about processes. There is this uh, self-care device. There are others, but I picked that just by means of an example. It's called TidoCare. Um, it's a home monitoring device where you can do your ear scans and your laryngeal scans and uh, send it and you're connected via telemedicine with, with the doctor that tells you, okay, bring, bring the kit to the clinic or not. It's reimbursed in Israel, I believe, and it's out there in the market. It has a, a CE conformity assessment. So is that something that's relevant for the system? Do we want that in the system? How would we evaluate that? What do the physicians say, et cetera? This is just to put it out there and say, there is lots of questions around innovations like that. So to conclude, again, we have to address the innovation challenge if we go forward in, in developing the healthcare system in a way that makes use of digitalization opportunities. Um, if we talk about health in all policies, we also have to talk about health in innovation policy. Um, we have to continue developing the demand side policy measures in terms of, for instance, um, articulating demand, uh, allowing the net networks that, that enable that. And again, the LBE and structures like that are an excellent example because you have the, the buyers and the, the developers on the table and can discuss these things on exchange platforms. We need missions and goals for transformation, strategic thinking and, and sort of guidelines and defining, there's a word missing, defining paths to the regular care market. Uh, we need to avoid fragmentation. And then there is, of course, the EU level with the European health data space, which uh, bring potentially a lot of movement into that, into that area as well in Austria and health, elsewhere. Uh, we have to think digital health from a public health perspective. So reflecting on what's the evidence, is it useful for whom, who is possibly excluded, where do we want to go? And also think about digital public health. So what are the digital tools that we can use to develop better public health interventions? And we cannot forget about digital health literacy and health professional education in these areas. And with that, I want to come to a close and I hope I made it on time. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, thanks a lot, Dr. Diglisek and Marquez for this very comprehensive perspective also from a public health view about um, opportunities we have, but all the challenges we are facing and even some solution you were indicating to. We have three questions within the Q&A. And the first one uh, is also about this international EU standards. So Rada Hussein, was one of our PIs, um, is asking you, in light of GEC, who was a partner in the e-action project um, for adopting European e-health reference architecture. So we, we see now the first release of the e-government era health reference architecture. And her question is, what is the current status or plan of Austria in mapping the Austrian e-health strategy within the European e-gov era health reference architecture? <laughs> 